uh, thank you everybody for joining us. If you're just logging on, um, please, we have this little poll launched um, ticket, just a couple quick seconds to fill out this poll so we can see who we have with us tonight. Um, my name is Cameron Reed. I'm the environmental program specialist here at the city of Shoreline. Um, and we're really excited to have you all with us. We're also excited to have Laura and Christy with us. Um, we, this workshop is funded by a grant from the Hazardous Waste Management Program in King County, which seeks to reduce uh, the hazards from toxic substances and help, help us find safer alternatives and uh, dispose of the ones we already have and make sure that's all a safe process. Um, tonight, we're really excited to have Laura Motter here with us. Um, to talk about how to transform a, a struggling lawn into um, something totally different, into a, a Pacific Northwest paradise. Uh, Laura is the Natural Yard Care Program Director at Tilth Alliance. Um, that they promote natural gardening methods uh, to support our environment and conserve resources. Um, the Garden Hotline is also a great uh, free resource that they run for King County folks. Um, you can call Monday through Saturday to get expert help on really just about anything gardening related. Um, so Laura will be going first, and then we're also super excited to have Christy Lovelace, who is the Surface Water Program Specialist for the City of Shoreline, here to talk a bit about um, the city's Soak It Up rebate program that provides up to $2,000 um, rebates for property owners in Shoreline to install rain gardens or native vegetation landscaping features. Um, so I'm going to close the polling now. If you, if you want to Tell us a little bit about yourself. Feel free to fill that out. Um, and yeah, we're getting some feedback that some folks don't see the, the poll. So sorry about that. That's uh, always something new with Zoom. So thanks for all of you that were able to submit um, that poll. And so a little bit first about why we're doing this here in Shoreline. Um, so Shoreline as a community, we have a strong um, just ethos to protect our environment, including our streams, lakes, and Puget Sound, um, and the health and safety of our residents. Um, so in 2018, the city earned Salmon Safe Certification. Um, so that's a group that works to make our, um, you know, works to certify uh, businesses and farms and, um, you know, campuses or, or cities uh, through the lens of whether their practices and facilities are safe for um, salmon. And as it turns out, not just, you know, our city municipal practices, but everybody, the whole city is connected through the stormwater drainage system. So when it rains, you know, the rain falling on our roofs and our driveways and our yards, it runs off and it goes into streams, lakes, and the Puget Sound really without, um, you know, formal treatment. So, you know, they've done a ton of studies that have been done in this region that have shown that uh, many common lawn care and yard care products um, contribute to pollution in the Puget Sound and in our local streams. Um, so there's, they've detected 23 different pesticides in Puget Sound waterways um, and more in urban areas than in agricultural areas. Um, so really pointing to those ones that are used widely on lawns. Also a third of all the copper in Puget Sound comes from pesticides and fertilizers that contain copper. So um, copper just, yeah, makes, causes all sorts of problems for um, salmon. Um, and also some of our lawn yard care practices can lead to increases in algae growth. So if we have, you know, if we're using fertilizers improperly and that is running off of our lawns into the streams and lakes, um, that can cause huge problems. You know, think of like Echo Lake being close to swimming um, if there's an algae bloom there. So um, just really important thing. We're all connected in this. We're all in this together. Um, and lastly, just a lot of these lawn products and, and garden products can also be hazardous for you and your family or your pets, and they require special handling and, and disposal. Um, and as we'll learn in our presentation, uh, a lot of times they actually don't help in the long run. So um, the methods that we're talking about tonight are really trying to get away from this and, and do something that's going to be good for your yard and your family in um, the, the whole community. So a um, little pitch here, if you wanna go pesticide free, you wanna be salmon safe, protect pollinators, protect kids and pets, um, you can uh, you know, make this commitment visible by requesting one of these uh, nice metal 
pesticide free zone signs. Um, you can do that. I'll send out this link as well. Um, we'll mail it out to you. Um, so feel free to, to do that. It's just a great way to, to yeah, make your commitment visible to the community. Um, okay, off my soapbox. Uh, we also have some awesome raffle prizes. So just by showing up tonight, um, if you're a Shoreline resident, you will be entered in a raffle. We have some cool weed pulling tools. Um, they're not actually this exact kind, um, but a, a similar make. Um, I have a couple soaker hoses and then the grand prize. So one person will get um, up to two yards of Cedar Grove organic compost delivered to your house, to your home. Um, so stay tuned uh, in the follow-up email that you'll be getting tomorrow to see who, is, who are our lucky winners. Um, so before I turn it over to Laura, just a few quick housekeeping things. Um, before we start, we'll be going till about eight, eight o'clock-ish. Um, and then we'll, we'll have time for questions. So there's a little QA button. Please use that to submit your questions as we go. Um, and then we'll be keeping tabs on that and we'll bring those questions back at the end. There's a little uh, thumbs up button. So you'll be able to you know, like if somebody asks your same question, you can like it and that'll bump it up to the top of the list for us. Um, and yeah, so we should be wrapped up here by 815, 820 or so. Um, we are recording um, and we will send out the recording and a list of all the different resources that are mentioned today in a follow-up email um, as along with the raffle prize winners, as I mentioned. So look out for that tomorrow. Um, and without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Laura. So go ahead and feel free to start sharing your screen. Thank you, Cameron. I'm going to transition here to my PowerPoint for you all. And we're going to talk about a few things here. We're going to talk about how to remove a lawn that you don't want any longer. Um, alternatives you might think about for that space if you want sort of a lawn-like look. How to improve the soil there and some plant choices for the area. So the reason we talk about removing lawns at all is because often they're in the wrong place. Um, people love their lawns, great place for a pet to play, great place for your kids to play, good for games, nice place to set up and, you know, read a book. At times we have areas that really aren't appropriate for a lawn. Um, and sometimes we have more lawn than we need in the first place. So it's great to think about shrinking it down. So some of the areas where a lawn really doesn't belong is on a slope like you see in the photo here. 12% uh, grade is about it for really being able to care for a lawn properly. Um, Cameron mentioned pesticides going into local waterways. This is one of the ways that can happen. You're spreading fertilizers or herbicides on a lawn like this and it washes off. It doesn't really penetrate, especially with a lawn because lawns often are notoriously not absorbent. Um, if we're not taking care of them properly, like if, if you uh, saw Lad's talk, you learned how to do that. But if we're not doing that properly, you get a big buildup of thatch, and then things just will move off of this surface very easily. <clears throat> the other thing is looking at areas where there's a lot of compaction in the soil, or there's a high water table already in that area and you just have a soggy place. Well grass doesn't like that. Grass likes well-drained areas. So having a lawn where you're combating ponding water all the time is just futile. It's there's no point in doing it. And then under conifers, under especially conifers, sometimes other big trees where you have a lot of tree roots, uh, big leaf maples or other large deciduous trees, under conifers, you also have all the needles. Um, there's lack of water because these trees are pulling a lot of the water out of the soil, and there's too much shade for most grasses. And then just in shady areas, you could get shade from a building. You could get shade from uh, a tree in the summertime that's leafing out or, or that dug fir that's in your backyard. Lawns need six to eight hours of sun daily, and if you don't have that, then you're not gonna have a very healthy lawn. So if you're thinking about doing an alternative to that, 
and don't want to go straight into just planting new plants and creating more of a perennial or woodland garden, um, you might think about transitioning to something like ecoturf. Ecoturf is a type of grass blend that's made with native grasses that grow shorter. They don't need as much fertilizer. They don't need as much mowing because they grow shorter. Many of the lawn grasses that we grow are really very tall grass varieties. So we have to mow them as often as we do because of that. <clears throat> Ecoturf will grow shorter and you don't need to do as much mowing. It's also typically blended with, and you can add to this, things like clover or daisies or other uh, perennial wildflowers like yarrow, which can be mowed over and over again. And those blend into the lawn and make kind of a pretty flowery lawn for you. Clover is one of those items that used to be sold in grass seed and was removed probably somewhere in the 1950s when people started to desire just a pretty much monocrop lawn. Clover actually is really beneficial to lawns because it, it brings nitrogen to the lawn and grass grows a lot and needs a lot of nitrogen. So they're, they're a good blend to put together. But you could transition away from grasses entirely and look at things like in a shady area, just put in some baby tears, especially in areas that are harder to mow, or if you just have little patches where the grass doesn't do well, that kind of thing. Um, in really sunny areas, you could think about transitioning <clears throat> to creeping thyme, which is something that loves the sun and will grow in fill out. And both of these things, the baby tears and the creeping thyme, if you put them in properly and let them grow in to fill in and keep it weeded, they will be really efficient at keeping weeds down themselves. And so all of these things really help in the sense that they don't require a lot of fertilizer, they don't require pesticides to monitor, um, to keep down the weeds that want to grow there. It's a, it's a win-win. And here's an image I want you to sort of contemplate. Um, when we were kids, um, most of us probably enjoyed, you know, being in a lawn full of daisies. You can see that there's a mixture of clover in here too. I know when I was in junior high school, we, one of the favorite things we did in, in um, the spring was to be able to go out and sit in the field outside the school and have class. So when we were lucky enough to do that, everybody would be making daisy chains. <laughs> to put in each other's hair and it was really fun. So daisies are one of those plants that can be compatible in a lawn. It doesn't take over, it doesn't kill the grass. Um, it looks sweet and it is a sign of a healthy lawn as well. So I wanna talk a little bit about soil because soil is sort of the most important thing that we are, as gardeners, are um, working with. If you have very healthy soil, you're gonna reduce the need for chemical fertilizers and pesticides. And again, we don't want to add a lot extra to our properties because we don't want that ex excess running off into the storm drains. Um, a healthy soil base will reduce your irrigation needs. If you have deep, rich, well-drained soil, it's gonna hold on to water well, um, especially if it has organic matter mixed into it. And with the organic matter being mixed into it, it's really efficient at filtering out urban pollutants like, this, like the oils that you see, gasoline and oil you see going into the storm drain in this top photo. They actually will capture the hydrocarbons in place and those will break down over time and you have fewer metals then also going out into the waterways. Um, so it's sequestering storm water as well. It'll slow water down. So rain gardens are built with heavily composted soil on purpose in order to slow storm water down. So this is important. If you have healthy soil, you're actually keeping the water from rushing into the storm drains and overwhelming them. And then healthy soil also stores carbon from the atmosphere, which having a carbon sink is important because it reduces the amount of greenhouse gases that we have in the atmosphere. So I wanna take a look at what soil is. So soil is not just dirt. We think of soil rarely. We walk on top of it. We don't consider that it's actually a habitat under our feet. It's made up of mineral particles that are in different sizes. 
and the different sizes will help you understand how well your soil drains or how well it doesn't, how well it holds on to nutrients, how well it doesn't. Um, and the class that's night for next week will go into more depth about this so you can understand a little bit more about that and how you can test soil for yourself. Soil also has air and water in it. And that's a crucial component. You have to have air in order to keep roots alive and to keep the little critters that are in the soil alive. And then you have all of the different soil life that's in there, which is using the organic matter that's in the soil to keep it alive and helps to break it down and provide nutrients to your plants. So in essence, it's not really that we're feeding soil or we're feeding plants, we're feeding soil and we're feeding the life that lives in the soil, which allows plants to be able to get those nutrients. So it's important to keep it healthy, to keep it aerated, to keep it um, free of chemicals, and that will keep it healthy for your plants. These are some of the critters that you're going to find in soil. Um, the soils in the whereas soils in the Midwest are uh, more um, bacterial, but we have, we still have all of those things in our soils here. You can also get information from getting a soil test, and we'll go over this in the next class a little more deeply about how you test your soil. But soil testing will determine a, a health baseline for your soil. You'll know kind of where you stand. It can assess the nutrient quality. It can, you can get good guidelines for what you need to amend it with. Uh, often people buy things and just put them in, and this is a problem um, where you get excess fertilizer that isn't usable by the, by the plants because it doesn't need it. Uh, there's enough of that in the soil. For instance, lawn fertilizers and phosphorus aren't allowed in Washington State anymore unless you can prove with a soil test that you are phosphorus deficient or you're putting in brand new lawns. Um, you can get guidelines for what amendments you need from the soil te testing labs and you can also call the hotline, the garden hotline, to get sort of a one-on-one um, -on -one, uh, review of it. We can go over it with you. Um, but you can also assess toxin issues. So the list that I have here is just some ideas about places that you might want to know um, what kind of toxins might be in the soil. Houses that were built pre to 1978 could have been painted with lead paint. There could be paint chips in the soil. Old orchard grounds could have been sprayed with arsenic, which lead-based or uh, pesticides, and that could be in the soil. Old industrial sites like substation um, spotter shops could have pesticides or um, other uh, PCBs or auto shops could have leaded gasoline as well or oils. If you're downwind of cement plants, there are um, heavy metals in the um, plumes that come out of there. And then uh, of course the Asarco smelter plume affected um, areas along um, the shoreline in King County, mostly in South King County but a um, little bit to, to the north. Um, and then there's the um, smelter up in Everett that has done the same. Um, and if you're along a busy highway, <clears throat> you need to be thinking about, you know, in the, in the past years, we had lead gasoline and there could have been um, some contamination from that. And if you're very close to a highway, there are things that come off tire wheels um, that are heavy metal based as well. Um, when you're looking at how you're approaching the work in your garden, and we're asking you to consider using less pesticides, sometimes you come across products that you've had sitting around for a while. I know when we um, took the um, basement materials out of my parents' house after my father passed away some years ago, we found a lot of old pesticides there, and we had to have a place to take it. Unfortunately, in King County, we have the hazardous waste disposal locations. For North Seattle, that's up off of Aurora on Stone Avenue North, um, near Haller Lake. It's very easy to get to, and um, it's a really wonderful service to have. No questions asked. Just drive in, drop your stuff off. So we recommend that you take things like that there. If you don't think you're going to use it, just get rid of it and um, dispose of it safely and, and they will take care of that for you. It's better than you dumping it down a storm drain or pouring it across your yard um, because 
that's going to be just a dangerous situation. So if you're going to remove a lawn, how do you do it? There's a couple of ways. So if you're going to do it right now, and fall is a great time to be doing this because you can get a garden established in the fall very easily, great time to plant. You can do it in a couple ways. You can do it with a hand or mechanical tool. So if you're using a handle like what you see in these upper two pictures, one of the, they're both, they're all called sod cutters. The one in the middle picture is the half um, hoe and you can, or a cutter. You can use either of these. It's much more time consuming and a lot of work. But if you have a small area, say you have a very shady spot, you have a really sparse lawn, this little sod cutter on the top will be very effective at helping to just skim off that layer of sod that you have there. It's, it's not going to take much. Um, and it's, so it's great. You could use a hoe to do it as well, but this is a little bit bigger tool and gets a better cut. And you may find that there is some thatch buildup, even though it looks very sparse and you need to skim that off. The half moon um, tool can cut pieces out. So you can go through and just cut segments out and then pop them out of there. You can use garden fork to lift them. Um, the most important thing here is to try and get the soil off of there because you get a thicker piece cut usually when you use this method. And you don't want to remove all the soil. You want that good soil that's up in the top of the, of the soil level. Um, if you're going to use a mechanical tool, there's sod cutters like the one in the bottom picture. You can borrow those um, or rent those uh, from tool um, rental sites. Uh, they are heavy. Um, they are a little bit scary if you're not used to things like that, and they're best to use on the level ground. If you're doing some sod removal from a hillside, I would recommend the other tool, especially the hand um, sod cutter as well. But I would avoid using a rototiller. A lot of people do this. Um, it's one of the first things people think of because it seems simple and easy, but all you do is chop up the grass. It's a big mess. You end up with lots of piles of sod that's really hard to clean up after. With the sod cutting method, you actually are doing it in a much more um, organized way and you can actually roll up that sod. You could use it somewhere else if it's still fairly decent sod and you're just trying to reduce your, your lawn spaces. You could use it to patch areas that need patching. This is an example of people using a sod cutter. This was out at McAuliffe Park in Kirkland. Um, some years back, we expanded the garden, created a garden actually, there, but at the bottom of the um, hill, you can see there's some blueberry bushes there. This is a very soggy site. The blueberries are sitting at the bottom where they um, get a lot of water, which they like. Uh, but it took two people to manage this sod cutter because the soil was so wet, we had to pull on it as well. This is mechanized. It's supposed to have a drive but it still can get bogged down pretty easily. So we kind of had one person in front helping to steer and helping to pull as we strip the sod. And you can see the sod pieces on the side. Um, bear in mind, this is heavy stuff. So you know, be protective of your back when you're working on this as well. So the other thing you can do to remove a lawn is to do it over time. You can sheet mulch it, like the picture on the bottom, with newspaper or cardboard, and just wait. You put the newspaper and cardboard down. You layer wood chips or bark or whatever your choice is. I prefer wood chips because they have more nutrients in them, um, but that's a, a choice you can make. Um, you put that over the top so that it will kill the grass, but it takes a few months to do. Fall's a great time to do it because all of that carbon material in the, in the newspaper and cardboard will also break down. And then as it breaks down, it, it enriches the soil. And then um, everything gets um, worked into the soil underneath. So you can improve your soil while you're actually doing the lawn killing as well. Um, when you lay the newspaper or cardboard out, you want to overlap the edges. You don't want to leave seams that are continuous so that things won't grow up between them. And then you want to wet it down, ideally. It's good to put water over it. Um, that helps to keep it in place. It helps make it easier to put the uh, bark or the mulch back over the top of it. Um, the other way you can do it is to do it as you go, plant as you go. 
And I've done this for clients. I used to do my own landscaping work and I had a client out on Bainbridge. I did a lot of new beds like this on her property. She had a lot of grass. We weren't going to remove it. It was way too much work. So what we did was sheet mold it. We put carpet down and sometimes newspaper. And then we piled soil on top of it that she wanted for the area and, um, and made berms and planted directly into it. We couldn't plant really big plants. They were like a one gallon size plant and up, but we actually managed to get um, some significant um, berms built, putting new plants in it that within a year were filling out nicely. So the roots, what happens is the same thing. You're, you're smothering the lawn, but you're building a berm and you're getting plants into it that then start to um, put roots out and help to break up the lawn underneath as well. So that's another example of how you can get lawn removed. So if you are stripping sod, the, you know, everybody always has that question, what do I do with all that sod? Well, there are a couple things you can do. You can just sheet mulch over it. You can flip it over and just sheet mulch over it. And so we did that in part of this area that you see um, at McCullough Park here. But the little, um, squiggly line bed behind um, these ladies. This is Jen and Katie and Fala. Fala lives in Shoreline. Um, there's a um, long bed behind them that we just built with the sod. So we actually used most of the sod to build that berm and that became the edge of the garden. And then we sheet mulched over that and mulched it with wood chips. And so that remains to this day as an edge of the garden and it's, you know, has pollinator plants and different little shrubs and different things like that in it. Um, you can compost it on site if you want to. It, it's a bigger pile sometimes than you have room for, but if you have room for it, you can do that. That works just fine. Um, most um, sod is not really welcome at the transfer stations where you can take the clean green materials because of the amount of soil that it has in it. It's heavy, but um, that's always an option too. But it's cheaper, easier, less work. It's pretty heavy stuff. It's less work to just keep it on site and make sure to always flip it over because you want that grass to be on the ground and not facing the sun so that it won't try to regrow. If you were to take a strip of that sod and lay it back out again, it would just start growing and you'd have a little patch of lawn again. So you need to amend your soil when you get ready to plant. Um, the next class, again, we'll talk a lot more about this in depth. And there are several ways to do that. You can add yard or food waste compost that you've created yourself that you get through the um, curbside system, go back and buy it, um, what was made. You can use manure-based compost, um, biosolids from King County. There's all the GroCo materials. You can use uh, livestock manures. Uh, there's a lot of places that you can get um, manure. So get through Keen Conservation District. They have a manure program and you can just check their website and look it up and see who has what that they're sharing. Um, sometimes you get lucky and you find rabbit and alpaca manures which are really great amendments because you can add them fresh um, and plant directly into them because they're not chemically hot like most manures are. Manures need to be um, uh, need to be composted down so that they are safe to add except for things like alpaca and rabbit. And then if you have a vegetable garden or even a big area that you're going to replant but you just want to enrich it, you can actually grow cover crops in it. So cover crops are cereal grains and or uh, pea family plants and they break up soil with their roots, they protect the soil from um, compaction, from the rain in the winter, they add nutrient when you turn them in and um, you have pea family plants, you let them bloom a little bit, they're great pollinator plants for early spring. But all of these things will help you amend the soil. We're gonna put a new garden in. If you've removed sod, often you will find that the soil is drier and it's less nutrient dense because when we mow our lawns, we typically remove the grass clippings and we're not renewing uh, the soil in, in, in any way. And we just put fertilizers back on top of it. So when you have a garden space, Typically, you're adding compost to it or you're letting 
some of the leaves lie down in a forest system, the leaves fall and they make the soil better. In a lawn, it's pretty denuded of that. So we try to help with that um, by putting cover crops in. And then mulching is super important to help keep weeds down. In the winter time, it'll help keep the soils warmer, in the summer cooler. It helps keep moisture in the soil. Um, it makes it look more finished and your choice of mulch, you know, is yours to make. You can use composts in certain areas. You can use wood chips. Um, some things work better with certain kinds of plants, but basically it makes a nice finished look in the long run once you get it all um, sorted out and planted and all the mulch put around it. But it also creates habitat for beneficial insects and birds. Birds that are ground feeders like to kick around in mulch and look for things to eat. Uh, beetles, like the black beetles that you see in your garden, love mulch, mulched areas or protected areas, and they are great for eating slugs. So you want some kind of habitat as well. And then we also want you to plant. So why do you plant in the fall? Because soil temperatures are still warm in the Northwest. Um, because we are moving into our rainy season and so all of this makes it less stressful for plants and it's comfortable for you to work in, provided it's not pouring rain like some of the rain we had last week. Um, but you can work in this temperature uh, much more easily and get a lot done and it's a great time of year for plants as well. The Washington State University has a soil temperature map. It's actually an ag map. So um, if you go online, and we're going to give you a copy of this PowerPoint. You'll have this um, website link to access. Uh, but if you go online and just did a Google search for WSU AgMap, you would come up with this. And basically, there are different monitoring stations around the area that will tell you soil temperature, air temperature, air moisture, um, a lot of other measures that you can use to guide what you're doing um, in your garden. And soil temperature is helpful because it tells you if the soil is warm enough to plant certain things. We use this in particular when we're trying to figure out if it's time to plant tomatoes, for instance. Um, but it's great to see. You can, you can check it and see. I didn't look at it today, but um, you can check it and see what your soil temperature is. It's probably still fairly warm right now. Um, as long as soil temperatures are up above 50, things are growing pretty actively. And then here's just an example, and this is using Seattle just as a guideline, but for the area, for the Puget Sound um, Basin, um, pretty much this is what it looks like for us. We get all of our rains, you know, throughout the fall and winter and early spring, and then we have that really dry period in the middle of in the summer. Um, it's important as we move into September and October, you can see um, what the average is for October, that it's always a pretty decent amount of rain. It's not too much rain, which actually makes it perfect for planting things because soils aren't going to get waterlogged. You're actually going to give those plants a chance to get growing very well. So we're going to talk about plants now. So what kind of plants do you want to put in? Um, first recommendation we have for people is to always think about grouping plants that have the same needs. So this makes it more efficient for you when you're taking care of them. They're going to use less water. They're going to need less um, uh, care over the long run because you don't have to individually worry about a certain plant that is, you know, isn't getting the right amount of water that um, the other plants are getting around it. You can um, put things together like drought tolerant plants that will survive together. Um, basically, we're trying to help you create habitats and ecosystems that work well together. Um, and then in boggy areas, you can put in things like a bog rosemary or blueberries, some of these other plants that don't mind having their feet a little bit wet. Um, enjoy that um, as well. You need to think about whether they like sun or shade. So the plants listed here wouldn't all necessarily grow in the same place if one of them liked more shade than the other. Um, but the soil conditions are similar for these plants. Um, that's the first most important thing. And then considering what kind of light requirements they have as well. So we're gonna look at some of those areas we talked about where you had a lawn that maybe shouldn't be there, an area that's too shady, it's under trees, it's in, under conifers. What can you do with that? 
um, you're going to put in shady areas, and this is generically speaking, this is not talking about whether they're wet or dry, and so that's going to vary as to what can go under there, but you're going to put in things that are shade lovers. These could be things that are ephemeral, that they come up in the spring and then die back very quickly, like some of the spring bulbs. They could be, or bleeding heart, for instance, that's an example. It could be things like a hosta that's a perennial that comes up only for the summer and then is gone all winter. They could be evergreen ferns, like the deer fern on the top right picture. Um, all of these things are sort of a, a palette that you can use that work well in shady areas. And fortunately, there's a ton of shade, shade loving plants that are really quite beautiful. So transitioning an area that used to be lawn and just always gave you grief to something like this that takes very little care is a really wonderful choice. Um, when you're putting in things like hostas, you need to be aware of slug management, but you might instead pick other things that wouldn't need to worry, you wouldn't need to worry about them. So lots of choices, um, lots of pretty things, lots of um, to the shady areas as well, and lots of different colors of green that are really quite beautiful. And for soils, there's a lot of really fun choices. Some people like bog plants, um, pitcher plants, some of the, um, especially if it's a wide open sunny area, there's a lot of um, insect eating plants, or, you know, the carnivorous plants um, where the uh, insect put it in things that will like it. Um, blueberries. Love it, as I pointed out in that picture at McCulloch Park. So shade or sun, um, blueberries love the sun. So sunny, boggy spot, maybe you transition and put in a blueberry um, patch. Or you can put in things like different kinds of carrots or reeds or things that are more wetland-y type plants that are um, native to the Northwest, build a native garden with them and um, transition out of a lawn that you can never mow because it's too wet into uh, a garden that actually functions for you. And then slopes. Slopes have a lot of potential. You don't want to be mowing on a slope. It's dangerous. I've seen people, literally have seen people with ropes tied around their waist, lowering a um, mower down a slope and pulling it back up. It's incredibly dangerous and scary. Um, and not worth the effort. In the bottom two pictures, you see some examples of some slopes that were transformed. Um, the bottom picture itself is a picture out of, of a Sunset Magazine um, article. And this is showing this beautiful transformed hillside that actually, you know, they had some rocks built into it, but you can imagine what this would look like even if it didn't have the sculpture of the rocks. You put in a lot of perennials. These are all great pollinator plants. They're cutting flowers for you. Sometimes they're herbal plants that you can use in cooking. Uh, you can transition out of a lawn into something that's multifunctional and, and really beautiful. Or you could do something that's a little more calming, like the um, ground covers and the other um, application with the stairway, with the uh, ground cover growing in between the steps. So there's a lot of solutions to um, transitioning out. In both cases, there's still lawn in these yards, but they've chosen to keep them in small patches that's that are manageable and surround it with plants that they can get more use out of. Um, but these things can really be wonderful zones for pollinator plantings, um, especially if it's a dry sunny slope. Um, you can think about plants from California, the Mediterranean, um, many Washington native plants would work here. We have a lot of things that grow kind of in meadow settings that would do well here. You could fill it full of camas bulbs and have that bloom in the spring and be really beautiful. Um, and then have some other um, dry soil uh, native plants built into that slope. So Washington natives are pretty varied. A lot of people think, you know, oh, you know, Salal, that's a native. Salal so is, and it is one choice, but there are lots of choices. And the, one of the things that people don't think about very much are some of the deciduous shrubs that we have. These are really beautiful plants for 
for um, landscaping, things like red stem dogwoods. And there's a lot of hybrids of these that they've made to be short and dwarf or variegated leaved. Some of them have beautiful um, stems that go from orange to yellow. Uh, there's some that are just bright yellow and these are really beautiful in the winter time when they're bare. Uh, snowberry, which can colonize. So if you have an area that you really want to fill in, you could do things like thimbleberry or salmonberry or snowberry. And then you have fruit you can pick if you like the thimbleberry and salmonberry. Um, the snowberry, the birds will eat. They eat it last. It's kind of a last ditch food for them. But in the meantime, the berries are hanging on the shrubs. Shrubs are partially deciduous. They're, they have some leaves on them through the winter. And then these guys are beautiful in the wintertime with their white berries on them. Um, there's a lot of really beautiful Oregon grapes. Um, nine bark is a, a native uh, plant that gets about eight feet tall. It's quite beautiful. It has kind of stripy bark on it. Um, dry fruit capsules, birds eat the seeds out of. Some of these are um, big enough to be nesting or birds. They're a good cover for them if you to feed them in your yard. Uh, red flowering currant is one of those plants that actually has a flower in early spring that native Anna's hummingbirds love. are both really early bloomers and those are great for hummingbirds. And then there's tons of different kinds of ground covers. Um, I've showed you some pictures of the deer fern and different kinds of ferns. Um, Vancouveria is a relative of Epimedium, which is not a native here, but they are both um, relatives of the Oregon grape, but they grow at ground level. They're really good for dry soil. Great thing to put under a Douglas fir tree where you can't get other things to grow. Um, some of the small trees like serviceberry and vine maple and elderberry, great for birds, lots of food on them. Um, and then the larger trees, if you have room for them, um, you know, having habitat in your garden, it's ideal if you can have as much diversity in uh, form and size as you can and height, and you'll get different kinds of wildlife. The larger the tree, the more interesting, um, bigger birds you're going to get. You may see um, uh, blue herons sitting on the top of your trees. You may get flickers that come in, in and different kinds of woodpeckers and um, that's really fun when they come to your yard. So to do that of course you need to have a diverse garden. You need a garden that has year-round interest and this is also for your own benefit. It's prettier to look at. Uh, it's much more interesting for you. Um, you want to think about what has fall color. Right now, I have a Euonymus allotus. That's the winged Euonymus that you see a lot of times along median strips on roadways. It gets bright, bright, bright red. That's a deciduous shrub. And I, I see the color coming on that in my backyard right now. You want to think about winter structure. How does that plant look in the winter? Things like the red stem dogwoods um, have a very vase shaped structure, but they have that bright, bright. Um, stem as well. What things have those spring blooms? What things have fruit in the summer? Um, you can attract birds, bees, bats, and more to a garden by having the right plants in it. Um, and then you want to make sure that you put edibles in your garden. You can do double duty. Uh, the picture that you're seeing here is actually an espaliered uh, fruit tree fence. So this, these are individual fruit trees that have been pruned out selectively to make this lattice work just with their branches. And there's one on the far side too of this picture that you can see. So this surrounds another garden. But this will be double duty because you'll get fruit along those branches and then you also have this interesting fence that you've created. Um, but th there's a lot of different ways you can do that. And making plants have more than one function is always a good plan for a garden. And then, of course, we want to avoid noxious plants. So be sure to know which things are not allowed to be planted in the garden. Um, knowing the difference between what the classes are is helpful for you. A class A regulated weed has to be managed by law. It's not allowed. Garlic mustard is, is an example of that. And you see, you do see that around. Um, and it's, it's a little bit not intuitive because something like bishop's weed 
which is really an invasive plant, can be very, um, very, very difficult to control, but it also um, is not regulated. And part of the reason for that is that they're trying to regulate things that they think they can still get a hold of, but something like Himalayan blackberry, it, you know, there's no way we're ever gonna get rid of all of it. So they don't even try to do that, or they work on things that are agricultural pests and would be pretty um, devastating to um, agriculture if these things got out of control. Weeds can change status. Um, you can get information from the noxious weed folks. And I didn't put that link in here, but we can include that too for you. And then these are some of the resources that um, we recommend. So the, well, you're gonna hear more about the Soak It Up program. Um, there's some materials and supply vendors list, the garden hotline. And then some of these other um, things here coming after that are great places to look for plants. Um, get plant ideas that talk about, you know, whether they like sun or shade or wet soil or dry soil. Um, and you can, with the Washington Native Plant Society, you can look at landscape plants or you can also look at plant communities that happen in nature naturally in the wild um, and try to replicate that. Some of those may not be available because they're not all nursery plants, but you may be able to do some fun um, native um, plantings with the plant communities. Um, and then there is a Honey I Shrunk the Lawn video that King County did some years back that's also online. Um, don't forget that the King Conservation District has a native plant sale every spring. And also um, uh, uh, the Snohomish County does. You guys might be more interested in that if you're closer to where they are um, selling their plants as well. It's an online sale and then you go pick them up. Um, and then again, the Hazardous Waste Management Program in King County has a lot of resources to help you figure out where to um, take care of your hazardous waste and um, direct you back also to the Garden Hotline. Uh, they support us in our programming as well for information about um, how to take care of a garden. Um, so that's all I have and I'm gonna exit out. Awesome, thank you, Laura. Um, so I'm thinking, I'm thinking we'll, we'll hold all these questions until the end here, until after uh, Christy's presentation. Um, so yeah, Christy, you ready to go? I sure am. Let me just get my screen shared. Awesome. All right. Okay. Oops. So just a second, I just learned a new trick from Cameron on how I can share my screen but get my notes. So I'm gonna stop my share really quickly <laughs> and get set up with this cool new trick. You guys gotta show me now. Oh yeah. <laughs> a little bit of YouTubing goes a long way. Yeah. Okay. Looks great. Oh, but you know, okay. So sorry, one more time because I don't have the option that the YouTube video told me I would. Mm. Yeah, I usually go with the green box one. The yeah, box. I'm not seeing the um, buttons at the bottom though to go into presentation mode. Oh, weird in PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're kind of hidden, like they only pop up if you hover over them. I think. Okay, I think I'll be okay. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I know this program pretty well. <laughs> Not as well as Cameron. He's my predecessor, so I'll be. I can, I can fill in if you need. <laughs> so, yeah, Cameron will jump in if I miss something. Um, well, thank you all so much. Um, I'm excited to share our rebate program, Soak It Up. Oh, there we go. 
Um, so for the Soak It Up program, we provide uh, rebates to shoreline property owners for both rain gardens and native vegetation landscaping. Um, so I will dive into what these gardens are a little bit later in the presentation, but these gardens are really great opportunities if you are considering um, remaking, um, doing a makeover on a portion of your yard. Maybe you have something that's a bit too high maintenance or something's just not working out maybe you have one of those grassy areas that you need to um, you need to change up this could be a really good option our program participants um, when we've spoken with them the majority of them say that you know the reason that they opted for this program is because their home needed their landscape needed a bit of a refresh they really liked the environmental benefits of it and they were looking for something that ultimately was a bit more low maintenance these gardens certainly do take a little bit of work to get started, but once you have them in the ground and once you have those plants established, they can be these really beautiful features that are low maintenance and also are just these truly Pacific Northwest gardens. Um, and they bring all sorts of great uh, native birds about and also the beneficial insects um, that we like to see. So I just want to talk a little bit more about the environmental benefit. Um, Cameron definitely hit on this in the introduction, but I am with the surface water utility. And so when we talk about rain gardens and native landscaping having this great envir environmental benefit, we're also really talking about the water quality benefit that these gardens have. And so when rain falls down um, into our urban landscape, as Cameron was saying, it's going to move through these hardscapes that we've built. So we have houses, we have driveways, parking lots, we have roads, um, you know, and we have our, our yards and soft spaces too, right? Um, yards and parks. But what happens is, is the rain is going to fall down on these areas, you've all seen rain, you know, and it moves um, into the road oftentimes and it goes downhill. It collects whatever sort of pollutant it touches. And so I know Laura spoke to this too, but these can be garden chemicals. This can be pet waste on the side of the road. These can be car leaks. It can even be particles from our roofs. Um, all of this can get caught up in the water and that water then moves into our stormwater system, which is storm drains and shoreline. It's also really common to have the ditches outside of our homes. And that water is just piped directly into the nearest body of natural water. So here on the screen, you see this outfall, and this is just um, the outfall from the stormwater system. So all of that water that has fallen into the environment um, or into our neighborhoods, going straight into these streams without any sort of treatment. Um, it can also go out into local lakes. And so when we think about an urban environment compared to a more natural environment, if we imagine we are maybe living back in the old Pacific Northwest forest before there was any industrialized um, practices before there was any landscape, we know that the forest is going to have far less chemicals in it, far less pollutants in it, um, and that uh, when the rain falls down, it's going to hit the ground, it's going to get soaked up by trees and by plants, but that rain that doesn't get soaked up by trees and plants is going to slowly trickle down into groundwater systems, and it's going to slowly make its way back into those local waterways. One of the big issues that we have with stormwater as well is that it's really concentrated when it re-enters the streams because we're collecting from a large area of our neighborhoods and sending it in through these outfalls straight into the stream. And so we see a lot of erosion in streams, which can change the, um, the species that live in there. And then also erosion leads to all sorts of problematic issues like smothering of important stream bugs and also fish eggs. And just one more piece on, I guess, the pollution problem that comes in is that when we think about Puget Sound, when we hear about Puget Sound pollution and we hear about um, salmon and orcas and the waters and um, just the environment that they're living in being so polluted and those pollutants building up in their body, um, we're really talking about pollution that's coming from our neighborhoods and from urban environments. So this isn't just downtown Seattle, but it's neighborhood all of those pollutants getting caught up and sent in. And so that's why these rain gardens and native landscapes, that's where they come in and why they're important. So um, with the surface water utility, we're really interested in um, 
the ability of rain gardens and native landscapes to soak the water up, hence the name of our program, Soak It Up, uh, but to soak that water up and return it slowly to these natural groundwater systems. And so in this way, these landscapes can really um, mimic our more native forests instead of the more urban landscapes where we're directing water into our stormwater systems and then having it go out into the creek. So we'll see more filtration of pollutants that that water, that water may have touched, but it's also going to slowly re-enter those systems. Um, so to dive into both of those gardens, I wanna start by talking about rain gardens. So rain gardens are these shallow bowls. I'm sure that um, many of you on this call have seen them before, but they're shallow bowls and they fill up periodically with water whenever there's a storm. And the reason that they're filling up is because um, the uh, rain garden is connected to um, a source of water. So that might be it's most commonly seen is that it's a downspout from a roof. So it's actually collecting the roof water and going right into that pond. Um, and it, while it's in that pond, it lasts for about 24 hours, um, but the soil is uh, very absorbent and it takes that water, collects it, and then returns it back into natural groundwater systems. Um, so a more detailed engineering look at the rain garden system. Um, so you'll see over here on the left, we have the inflow. So as I mentioned, we have a source that the water is coming from. So this can be any hardscape. It's most commonly a roof, but it can also be a driveway um, or really any other hardscape. In our program for Soak It Up, it needs to be a hardscape that's on your property. But the water um, from that hardscape is directed through a pipe into the garden. So whenever it rains, the garden starts to fill up. Um, you'll see down at the bottom, we have our rain garden soil mix. So this is a specific soil blend that's meant to absorb uh, volumes of water. And there's actually a lot of really great and hot research that's going on right now on rain garden soil mixes. So I had mentioned that when water goes through soil, it also filters those pollutants. And so right now there are a lot of people, especially in Washington State, that are working on finding the perfect blend of rain garden soil mix that we're filtering out as many pollutants as possible. But this is a rain garden soil mix. You can get this at um, most nurseries. And then over here on the right, you'll see we have the overflow. So when sizing the rain gardens, we certainly work with residents to make sure that the rain garden is going to be sized appropriately to capture most storms in shoreline. Um, but there are always big storms or really long lasting uh, periods of rain. And so the uh, rain gardens are built with an overflow just in case of a large storm where there's extra rain that needs to come out of the garden. And this is just gonna protect that sort of bowl shape of the garden from erosion. Um, in the rain garden, we also have three layers of plants. And so um, you can see that we've got the bottom of the rain garden. And so we have plants in this uh, portion of the rain garden that really enjoy being underwater every now and then. As we move up the sides of the slopes, we have some plants there. Um, this is called zone two, and we can um, include plants that can take a, a little bit of a water bath, but generally speaking, maybe aren't in water as much. And then up on the top are uh, plants that would not do so well underwater, but of course it's the Pacific Northwest, so these are plants that will still do well with rain. Great. Um, I guess just to go back to the rain garden really quickly, I want to say this is a really powerful garden and um, in terms of pollution filtration and we'll compare it to the native uh, vegetation landscaping, but because we're actually directing water from a hardscape into these gardens, um, the, these gardens do a really, really great job of both slowing the flow and of uh, filtering for pollutants. Okay, back to this. Wonderful picture, so native vegetation landscaping. On the other hand, we are not creating a bowl depression, but rather we're working with the surface that we have. Uh, this specific garden is intended for landscapes that have um, originally are covered in either turf, some type of grass, um, are covered in um, some homogenous noxious weed, such as Himalayan blackberry, or are an existing hardscape. 
In this program, what we're doing is we're going to remove that hardscape turf or uh, noxious weed. We are going to revitalize the soils. Um, we're going to go about a foot down into the soils and we're going to amend those. And then we are going to finish off with planting native plants um, throughout. Um, we need at least for this program, we ask for 50% native plants, but we certainly are going to be very excited if you choose to do more than 50% native for this. So what do I mean by soil amendment and a foot down? So um, we've got three layers here. You'll see there's mulch on the top. We have loose soil with visible dark organic matter in the middle. And then down at the bottom is the loose or fractured subsoil. So working our way down from the bottom, um, we are going to go this bottom four inches that we're working with is going to be this really, really hard earth that's been compacted for a long time in your yard. And so we are going to break that up. We are going to till that area and we're going to scarify it so that our future native plants can get their little roots in there and continue growing um, to become healthy plants. Then we have this layer of loose soil with visible dark organic matter. And so um, in a lot of yards, there's maybe four to eight inches of soil. Um, that's pretty good and you can work with. There are unfortunately some shoreline properties that just have harder soil and they'll need a little bit more amendment. But if you have um, you know, some pretty good existing soil, then what we wanna see in this program is the addition of three layers of compost and you're gonna work that compost into the soil, you're gonna till it in, so it's all nice and mixed in, and you have this really, I mean, you could, you could stick a ruler down in there, that it's just nice, loose soil um, ready for planting. And then, whoops, sorry. Um, and then we have mulch, and so we're gonna put three inches of a wood-based mulch on top, and what that mulch is gonna do is it's going to help to squash out weeds, which is gonna make your life a lot easier, a lot less weeding to do. But also over time, it's gonna break down and just contribute to really nice, healthy soil. So we're actually regularly uh, replenishing this mulch. Um, that's our weeding effort for the year. And it's also gonna to continue to um, make for really nice, healthy soil. All right, and just this piece on natives and how they're working in the soil. Um, we see when the natives are planted in there, we see that they have much more, um, they have, tend to have longer roots, but also just thicker, more volume of the roots, denser roots. And that really helps to break up the soil um, and allow for a lot of those beneficial insects and microbial life in there and just make the soil nice and healthy. Also, the natives are going to encourage um, uh, beneficial bugs to be on your property, which is really great because that's gonna reduce your need for pesticide to get rid of maybe those other bugs that you'd rather not see on your property and those ones that are going to cause problems. Um, so there's a lot of natural yard care techniques in planting natives. Plus, of course, when we talk about low maintenance, they're adapted, we still have to think about right plant, right place. Laura shared a lot of resources that help to, um, sorry, my dog is a whiner. Um, but uh, to help you identify which plant is going to work best in those different locations. Um, and just to be clear, um, in this program we want to see 50% natives, but that doesn't mean that the other 50% should be invasive species. So we don't want to see any noxious weeds in there, or any weeds of concern. Um, there are native plants and then there are plants that uh, did not evolve here, but they don't cause problems when they're planted here. Um, and the reason that we don't require 100% natives as a program is because we also really want you to have the space to design a garden that you're really fond of and that you're really proud of. Um, and so we want to give you the latitude to do that. All right, some nitty gritty about the program. Um, so the program is open to all shoreline property owners. We commonly work with residents, but we also work with businesses, community centers, churches, um, all shoreline property owners. Uh, the rebate is for $2.50 per square foot treated or converted. So for our rain garden, that's going to be our square foot treated. So again, with rain gardens, we're going to be piping in water from a hardscape. So we're interested in what area of that hardscape is being treated by the rain garden, how many square feet. 
for the native vegetation landscape. We are interested in how many square feet of the um, yard you have actually converted to that native vegetation landscape, landscape and amended that. For this program, um, it is a minimum of 400 square feet of either treated or converted uh, square feet in order to qualify. So that's a rebate in the order of $1,000. And the maximum rebate is $2,000 or 800 square feet. You can certainly fill, build far beyond this if you please, um, but that's just the maximum rebate that we can give at this time. Again, 50% native plants need to be incorporated into either the rain garden or the native um, vegetation landscaping. And then um, finally, we uh, require a 10-year maintenance covenant uh, in order to qualify for the rebate. The maintenance covenant is uh, pretty straightforward in terms of what it requires for you. Um, so it just means replacing that mulch, making sure there's no weeds in the yard, um, maintaining the structural integrity of the rain garden, so making sure the inlet works, um, and making sure that there's at least that 50% plant coverage, or 50% native plants, excuse me. Um, the covenant does stay with the property title, so if you move, then um, say five years after you've had the rain garden or the native landscaping, then um, it sticks with the new property owner for the remaining five years. And in terms of um, how to meet that square foot minimum or maximum, whatever you're going, you know, making sure you have at least 400 square feet, you can um, do combination projects as well. So a lot of our um, previous um, program participants have done multiple native landscaping beds. And we've also seen um, uh, a rain garden and native landscaping. You could even do two rain gardens if you wanted. So again, for our rain gardens, we're looking for um, uh, the square footage is based off of the roof driveway or other hard uh, surface area that's been redirected into the rain garden. And for native vegetation landscaping, there's a hard surface lawn area or that noxious weed that's been removed and replaced with amended soils and native plants and mulched over. Mulched around the native plants. So soak it up, how to apply. Your first step is to contact me to schedule a site visit. I will come to your property and we'll talk about what your vision for a garden is, um, whether the rain garden or the native vegetation landscaping, maybe both is most appropriate for a yard and determine if you have eligible spaces uh, for this program. After that, if you are approved, then you can submit an application detailed proposal on what your garden will include, um, how large it will be, and um, what plants are included. After that, you'll be able to begin and complete your project, so it's really important um, to make sure that if you want to participate in this program that you submit an application and receive approval um, from us before you begin the project. That even means mulching out any ground might be removing make sure that we are collaborating on this from the beginning. Then you'll schedule, um, after you complete the project, you'll schedule a post inspection. I'll come in, make sure that the application matches the final product. And then after that, uh, we'll do the covenant signing and you will receive a rebate check within six weeks. Just a note for projects in critical areas, uh, Shoreline does have quite a few streams. Um, and some of these can be surprising because some of them are piped throughout different areas of the city. So you might be next to a stream and not know it. When I meet with you for, initial, for an initial site visit, I'll bring this information um, to the site visit if you are in a critical area. Um, but it just changes of disturbing up to 500 square feet per year um, with this, and then also um, it needs to be 100% native species for either of these programs. And I wanted to include two photos because on the left here, this homeowner actually is, um, they've got water that comes, uh, the house is, for the picture on the left, the house is just to the left, you can't see it here, but there's a downspout, but the water comes out of the downspout and then goes along this pathway is a little river rock area. And so it flows down this river rock all the way to the base of the hill that curves around the corner in the backyard and then collects 
in their rain garden down there. Um, so this is a, a stunning piece and they really worked in um, a large flow of rain as well to this section of the garden. And finally, to leave you with some autumnal, autumnal feels, some ball feels, here is uh, a native landscaping out of Hillwood. All right, thank you. Please reach out if you have any questions about the program um, and would like some more information or would like to schedule a site visit. Thank you. Awesome, thanks so much, Christy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now we're gonna do Q&A and actually, Christy, would you be able to help read the questions off? Just kind of, we can go in the order that they were presented. My, my, I have been crashing a few times here and so I've, I've lost the questions. But. Yes, I'd be happy to. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, so the question that's ranked at the top, suggestions for lawn removal and planting under large cedar tree with neighboring fir trees and large laurel hedge. Lots of roots. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> um, planting under a large cedar tree. So a lot of those plants that I showed you um, that prefer dry soil and shade would be what you were looking, would be looking for under a conifer. Um, Cedars use up a lot of water. Um, Doug firs would too. Any of anything under a, a conifer is going to be dryish. You're going to have a lot of roots, so you want to start with small plants too, because you don't want to be disturbing the roots too much. So look for things that have, you know, are four inch or gallon size at the most, um, and then look for plants that prefer dry shade. That plant list that I put into the res resource has a great list of plants that like that. Um, the book um, that's on the resource sheet that I gave Cameron, which you guys will all get, it's a PDF um, called, right, uh, called Right Plant, Right Place, has lots of different uh, scenarios of where you can, how you can choose plants. Um, one thing that works really well in that setting that I love to use is Epimedium. And uh, Vancouveria is the native version of that, although Vancouveria technically is native to the South Sound and beyond, um, but it still works pretty well in the Northwest or in the Puget Sound area. Um, those work really well, they love that setting. I had a bunch of them under a sequoia tree at, at, in a house I used to live in in uh, Wedgwood in Seattle. And the other thing I put under there, which is not a native, is a large um, hydrangea anomala, which is, um, I think it's anomala, it's one that gets very big and it has more of a kind of a white bract flower on it. It's not the big blue hydrangeas, but even hydrangeas can tolerate a setting like that if you give them a little extra water as well. So there, there's a lot of things that can work under there. Now under the laurel hedge, that's gonna be really tricky. You might think about ground covers that can sort of penetrate and grow underground and um, spread. Um, there is a rubus that wor works as a ground cover that might work in that setting. It's not going to like it if it's too shady, but if the, if part of it, if, it, if there's sun um, angling in and getting to it, it would work well and it would fill in just fine. Um, you might try, I don't know, I don't think Pachysandra would work well there. It likes more moisture than that. It grows too tall. There's going to be fewer things under there. What you might think about instead is doing like a bunch of different kinds of spring bulb, bulbs and maybe some summer blooming bulbs that are small, short scale. Things that are ephemeral that come and go that don't need as much much of anything, you know, other than what, what they need to keep the bulb alive. Um, so that's what I would recommend in a setting like that. It's, it's hard. Laurels are one of the toughest things. Um, unless you limb them up and then you could treat them more like you would the conifers. 
Could you also, Laura, kind of build, slowly build up the soil, like add a bunch of mulch, maybe, maybe not sheet mulch per se, but you know, just kind of slowly build it up? Under you may kill your laurels if you do that. So mm -hmm. one of the things you need to be careful of when you are transitioning and say you have lawn under a tree and you want to get rid of it and you're going to put this garden in, you don't want to build the mulch level up too high around the base of anything woody because you can smother the tree. You can also put a lot of moisture against the base of the tree that can help rot the bark out and bark is intended to help protect your plants. So when you're destroying that then you would um, put the tree at risk or the shrub at risk. So you can kill, laurels are hard to kill, but you can kill them by over mulching underneath them for sure. Thanks. Great, thank you. Okay, so for our next question, there's actually two related questions. So the first is how late can we plant a lawn or lawn alternative? And then similar to this question is November, too late well, to remove let's talk a about lawn, the lawn and first. put in plants um, Lawn's best put in if you're going to add a lawn by October. Um, if you go too far into November, you run the risk of frosts and it's not going to grow very well. Uh, grass is a cool season plant, so any time from now until when we get our first frosts, you can be working with that. Um, but you know, it's hard to know <laughs> when that's actually going to happen. There's no actual forecast for that. Um, you can keep an eye on the, new, on the weather. You can look at that ag weather map and see what the trends are. Um, but I wouldn't go past mid-November at the very latest, for sure. Uh, we don't recommend people plant cover crops past mid-November. And the only ones that really do well at that point um, are the cereal grasses, because there are more cold tolerant grasses in general. But sod, if you're bringing sod in or you're trying to um, germinate seed from scratch um, with a lawn, it's going to be tougher if the colder it gets and it'll be patchy and you won't be satisfied with it. Um, but for other plants, um, winter, you can plant all throughout the winter as long as the ground isn't frozen. So this is just a matter of kind of checking what the weather is doing. If you know we're going to have a stretch of pretty decent weather, you can go ahead and plant. It's ideal to plant before we get into colder weather though because the soils are warm enough for the root system to, to develop and you're going to get a healthier plant. So if the root system can develop fully um, and continue to grow while we're moving into winter, you're going to have a stronger plant next spring when it starts to put new growth out. So ideally before frost, even for other kinds of plants. But that being said, if you have something and you want, you know, say you want to move a tree when it's dormant, you could do it in December, you can do it in January, as long as it's not too cold. Um, watch the weather, look at that ag weather map, you know, engage for yourself. Um, as far as you're moving along, you can do that whenever you want. It's just a matter of smothering it or ripping it out. If it's too wet, if the soil's too wet, like my backyard has a rockery and then a very steep hillside. I live in Dell Ridge um, area in West Seattle and it's super soggy out there. I can't mow the lawn until May usually because it's too wet. Um, so I don't own the house, so I can't just rip the entire lawn out, but I have started to decrease some of it and especially at the base of that wall where it's just soggy and wet. So I'm transitioning to putting, right now I just have containers there so I don't have to worry about the soil moisture levels, but I will transition into plants that don't mind being wet in the winter and dry in the summer so that they can just be there. Um, but if it's too wet an area, you know, wait till it dries out to work on it because you can compact the soil by tromping around on it too. On mute. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. So next question. Is there anyone that can help me de design a small street side yard? I'll buy the plants, rocks, etc. Do um, there are lots of people that you can hire to do this, certainly. Um, we can help you find those people. Um, you guys probably have, you know, some recommendations, especially when you're looking at um, you know, the work that you guys are doing in the rebate program. Um, 
for, you know, if they're putting in a rain garden, that kind of thing, there are people you want, definitely want people who know how to do that work. Um, but I think also you can, for something like that, a project like that, if it's small, you can call the hot garden hotline. We can talk you through some of that as well and look at pictures. You can show it to us um, in, in photographs. Uh, we can talk to you on the phone. Uh, we can look at a Google map of the area while we're talking to you on the phone and kind of get a glimpse of what the space looks like, things like that. So we can help with smaller areas, um, but we're not gonna, we don't draw the design for you, but we can help you with ideas about what to do. Really, it's more, you know, what I recommend to people is, People don't think they're creative, but they really are. I've had people in classes who say, oh, you know, I really have to do something about this yard. It's terrible. And when you actually see it, it's not terrible. It's okay. There's just a few things that need to be fixed. So have confidence in that. Um, walk around your neighborhood. Go look at and see what you like out there. See what works in your neighborhood already and what's doing well. Um, Go to um, gardens, and especially ones that might have signage like a Bellevue Botanical Garden or the Arboretum at the UW, and see what you like. Um, nurseries are a great place to get a glimpse of things, but you don't see what they look like in real life when they're grown. You know, like Christy showed you those pictures of those baby gardens. Those are little bitty plants, but that doesn't give you an idea what the scale of it's going to look like. So those plants that are all four inches tall next to each other, one of them's gonna end up being five feet tall and one of them's gonna end up being a foot tall. So you don't have a perspective on that when you look at things in a nursery setting, it's good to go look in real life. So that's where I, 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 if people are feeling stuck, that's what I suggest first is go look, see what you like. You can call us on the hotline, we can talk you through that um, and help you figure out how to place things. Thank you, I will just add Add that for the rebate program that we do have a list of local uh, contractors that can help with the designing and also the build for the rain gardens and for native vegetation landscaping. So I'm happy to share that resource with attendees and um, that's something that you would get with the program as well, that information. And I think there was somebody who was interested in that. So that answers that question for Allison, I think. Yes. Oh, well, yeah. Great. Okay, this is definitely one for you, Laura. Oh, oh, sorry, I was scrolled down. Let's start with the one on the top. I really enjoyed the last class, but thank you for doing these. One problem I have in several spots in uh, the yard and rocky areas are horsetails, which are very tenacious. I know regular weed killers don't work on them, uh, but I would like to know any tips you have for getting rid of them. Um, yeah, horsetails are very tenacious. They are very deeply rooted. Um, they have a different they have a different life cycle than most plants because they're not flowering plant. Um, they're very primitive and old, and um, they like sun and they like moisture. So when you have that combination and they're already entrenched, you have to change conditions for them to reduce. Now, you may not be able to get rid of them entirely, but what will happen is they'll get less um, robust and more spindly and really easy to just pull a few out. Um, it helps to shade them out by planting other plants in the area, so keep it planted. Um, if you have an area like a rockery where you're really trying to do more of a, you know, a rockery garden, it's very difficult because it's hard to change that condition. That's one of the hardest places. Um, to get rid of them. And I don't know what to tell people in that situation other than, you know, you might have to change your expectations of what you plant in that area. Maybe it isn't a place you can put a rock garden. Maybe you have to put shrubbery there and camouflage essentially um, and build a rockery somewhere else where you can control the situation and not have the horsetail in it. You want to make sure you get ahead of horsetail too. They have a sporing um, stem that comes up in early spring when we're not paying attention. And when we see them is when the vegetative part is up. And then by then they've already spread their spores all over the place. So you wanna get ahead of it, get those sporing parts out. Don't spread them around, don't wave them around. When you pull them, put them in a bag, put them in your, um, in your yard waste bin and um, get them out of your yard. You can help reduce the spread of them, but they also spread by underground stem. So, you know, you're gonna have them there for a while 
um, but you just need to either change the conditions or camouflage them out or change your, um, ex and change your expectations. It's true that pesticides do not work on these. Uh, I worked with City Light for 10 years as a gardener. We did not spray horse tail. It was, it's pointless. Wow, oh, very resistant, very tenacious. <laughs> Okay, um, so this is in regards to the rebate program. Do we need to keep our receipts for plants, et cetera, in order to receive the rebate? The answer is no. The rebate is calculated purely based on the square footage if either treated for the rain garden or the square footage converted for the native vegetation landscape. So we just review the plans and we make sure that we are um, that the garden that you're proposing is one that works for our program. And if it is, then once it's uh, in the ground, then we go and we take a look to make sure that it matches your application. And if it does, then it's just purely based off the square footage. Great question. All right, next question. A tree in my front yard got destroyed by snow and ice this past winter. Now the hostas that enjoyed the shade beneath the tree are too sun exposed. Can I tr transplant these to a shadier um, spot? And if so, yes, you can. I would wait till they start to die back um, when those leaves are pretty, you know, that's how it can happen soon. They're, they're holding pretty steady right now. My hostas all look beautiful still. Um, so wait till they die back and then you can go ahead and lift them or you could wait until the spring to do that and just leave them in place. It's not going to hurt them to be through the winter there because they're dormant. So, um, Spring is a good time to lift and divide. You can actually divide them at that point and make yourself more plants. So I would wait till spring personally, because I think um, there's plenty of other things you can do in the yard in the fall. It's not gonna hurt them to, to be there right now, um, unless this is an area where you are thinking of converting for the program, in which case you can do that anytime. But what, what you could do if you're not ready to plant them somewhere else is divide them and put them in pots and then protect them somewhere and take care of them through the winter that way as well. Great. How long does soil hold toxins from lead paint from houses built pre-1978? So lead doesn't go too far to, doesn't break down too much. It's a, it's a, you know, it's an element. So it stays around. Um, we do a lot of work with the Dirt Alert program in King County and, um, what we advise people if they find that they have a lot of lead paint, especially around the edges of houses, is um, you minimize your contact with that soil, keep it mulched um, so that you're not getting in contact with the lead, and especially if you have children in the house. Um, if you have it in other areas, like out in the open parts of the yard, um, where you want to put a vegetable garden in, build a raised bed, and you don't have to worry about contact with it that way. Uh, but it doesn't really um, disappear too quickly. So it's something to keep in mind when you're testing your soil. You're going to more likely find it high in high levels around the perimeter of a house. If you find it high, high lead levels in other parts of the property, something else happened there. Um, we've had those mysteries before where we've tried to track down, you know, maybe there was a garage on this site at one point and people used to park cars with lead gas here. Um, so uh, yeah, it doesn't go away too fast. Thank you. Uh, the next question, if I have a lot of moss, does that mean the area is boggy? No, not necessarily. Actually, moss likes a lot of compaction, uh, like shade, it likes acidic and um, poor nutrient poor soils. So if you can change all of that, you can get rid of moss more easily. Um, uh, Something to keep in mind about moss though is it's an important part of our, our um, e ecosystem because a lot of birds use it to build their nests. So hummingbird nests are built out of moss and lichen and spider silk, literally. So if you don't have it, they don't have it. Um, it's a pretty kind of magical little thing. They collect all that stuff and make these tiny nests. Um, but moss is an indicator that the soil is compacted. Usually that's a number one thing. Um, so if you can change that, you, you can fix that. Um, boggy soils tend to get other things like um, um, other primitive 
plants, hornwort and liverwort and things like that in them more than they do moss, mosses. And um, the reason moss likes the compaction is that it is also a primitive plant. It has little gametophytes that go into the soil, but there has to be a film of water because they swim, they're flagellated. So they swim to each other and that's how they mate. And it's not like they're not making seeds. It's not a plant pollinating or a, a creature pollinating them. They're actually swimming around in water that we aren't really thinking of as water. It's just on a really small, you know, really micro level. Um, so well-drained soil will help you take care of that. Um, but it's not, boggy soil is going to be evident because it's going to be squishy. It's going to be pondy um, and usually not a lot likes to grow in it. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, what was the other name that you gave earlier, earlier, Laura, for the Vancouveria? Um, oh, there's another plant that's related called Epimedium. Epimedium. So Va Vancouveria, I don't know what, if there's a common name for that. Somebody else might. I, there's certain plants that um, we tend to just use their native or their uh, Latin name for. Um, and Vancouveria is one of those, um, but it's related to Epimedium and they're very similar looking. Uh, the leaf structure is a little different, but they grow very similarly. And Epi Epimedium is not native here, but it um, grows, both of them grow very well in dry, shady soils. Great, thank you. How do we get rid of creeping bellflower? Um, I'm not sure, again, common names sometimes can be, throw me off. So I'm not sure what the creeping bellflower is. It's a blue flowered plant mm -hmm. we're talking about. Uh, yeah, Jennifer says Vancouver E is it the inside out flower, and I think that might be one of the common names for it. Okay. Campanula. Okay. A campanula. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. That yes. So um, really, just being vigilant and pulling it out. It seeds all over the place. It's one of those plants, annual plants are plants that come to um, full cycle in one year, but bellflower is one of those that behaves like an annual, but it's a perennial. And so it has the capacity to live over and have a plant that stays for a while, but it, it distributes, you know, thousands of seeds as well. So catching them before they go to seed, um, digging them out, uh, they spread a little bit underground. You just have to be vigilant. They're not as bad as other things, so it can be done. You can also um, uh, overgrow them with other things that are stronger plants than they are. All right, thank you. Um, back to hostas, what is the best slug control for hostas? Um, I love slug traps. Um, if you have a lot of hostas, that's a lot of work. You can use things like um, the iron-based, um, iron phosphate-based slug baits that are fairly safe. But when you do, you want to make sure you use them as per the label. You don't need to spread a ton of it around. Iron is an element that goes into the ground that plants will use, so that's a benefit. It's not like, you know, going to sit around and then uh, run off in the stormwater as much as other things would. But if you use too much of it, it will because the plant can't take it up. Um, but it, it can work in areas where you have a big planting, but if you just have a couple of plants, slug traps are great. Now you can do them either with like the traditional little cup in the ground with beer or yeast, yeast and water, baker's yeast. Uh, slugs are attracted to the yeast and the beer and the yeast itself in, that you use, um, and they fall in and drown. So they have to be deep enough. You need to leave a lip up above the ground so that black beetles don't fall in them because black beetles eat your slugs. You want to build habitat around hostas with things like native grasses in the sunnier areas or just grassy plants. Um, put in mulch that beetles like so that you have beetles in the area because they'll help you keep the populations down. Um, you can also use a trap that's instead of using the baiting trap, you can put in a little rock and a, like a wood shingle on the rock so that it creates a, a gap underneath it. And the slugs will gather under there on a sunny day where it's you know wet and moist and shady and you can basically harvest them off and toss them in your compost bin 
not your home compost bin, but the curbside bin. Um, so there's a couple ways to collect them. When you do the beer trap or the yeast trap, you kill them and you actually dig a hole and bury them and fill it up again. It's a great method for plants like a hosta that keep getting chopped down or dahlias that are mowed down by slugs early in the season while the point growing points are trying to come up. Um, sometimes you can take it away and, and you will have some damage on them. Um, especially if you build up those predator populations in your garden, you'll have less damage. But you can also just keep a little trap going all summer long just to keep the populations down so they don't do as much damage to the hosta. Great. Some great options, some really fun options too. Yeah, the slug trapping is fun for kids too, or kids can do slug hunts. You know, um, they can go out at night with little, you know, lights on their heads and go searching for them or a flashlight. Um, and a lot of kids like to do that, actually. So I know people who do that. That's great. Um, all right, I have a steep west facing lawn, quote unquote, I want to remove and to plant native plants. It drops about 15 uh, in feet and uh, it drops about 15 feet in 15 feet and I don't want to terrace. Are there alternatives? Um, yeah, that's harder for sure. Terracing is a lot of work. You can do, um, you can do like compost sock kind of uh, applications where you fill, or you can use burlap bags and you fill them up and just sort of place them in, you know, curves on the, on the hillside and plant behind them. Especially good if you're doing things like getting plants from the conservation district sales where they're just small starts. So you, you basically, you can live stake into the hillside too with fresh cuttings and things. Um, but um, you're, you're trying to get things established without erosion on the hillside. You could also do this in stages where you just start cutting into the hill in patches instead of removing the whole lawn at once and plant um, and keep doing that and using these berm, sort of bermed sock things. Um, and then um, as those start to attach, you know, get roots built into the hillside, they'll start to shade out some of the grass and you just keep doing that. It takes longer, but it's safer to do. There's less erosion um, and you don't have to break your back trying to get that out of there as well. I wonder, Laura, if that'd be a good opportunity to do some, some berms out of flip sod and sheet mulch over it. You could try that. Um, it's harder to strip the sod out of there, but you right. could you could do that. Right. Um, that's a good point. If you're using one of those handheld sod cutters, you could strip pieces, flip them, create berms, plant behind it. Right. And you could do, you know, sort of do that incrementally until you're done. Yeah, good, good suggestion. Looks like we got Great. one more question here, and, and this one is showing up for me, Christy. Oh, okay. Go for it. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Thanks for subbing in there. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so this one is uh, in getting rid of bishop's weed under rhododendrons. How do I prevent harming the rhody roots? Been unable oh. to get rid of it. Oh, that's a pain, that plant. Um, <laughs> I had a client when I was doing my own landscaping work up in Edmonds who had a triple lot and she had this huge backyard with a lawn and then a hillside that went up to a fence and it wrapped around the whole backyard and, you know, triple lot size. And it was covered in bishop's weed in probably two thirds of it. Um, so we just took our time with it over and over again in areas where we could, we did some sheet mulching, especially under the rhododendron roots because you can't dig down and get it out. Um, um, we did do a little spot spraying in some areas with Roundup just to to get those areas that were very, very difficult, but it was very targeted spraying. Um, so right. that's, that's an application where sometimes a pesticide can be, a herbicide can be helpful, but you know, doing it properly, not overdoing it, not spraying the whole darn hillside, right. hand doing what you can, but like targeting a little bit. Um, but you wanna be careful around the roots of the roadie because you can harm the roadie with the Roundup as well. So right. be aware of that. Uh, sheet mulching worked pretty well for us under the plants where we were able to sort of smother it um, and keep weakening it. Um, and as we got rid of the rest of it that was out in the open, 
there wasn't as much to keep feeding that and to keep it regrowing. So we were able to just sort of weed it out over time. It took a while, it took about two years. It's a project. Yeah, not really easy hard. answers for some of these hard, hard no. problems. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, thank you all for some wonderful questions. I, if there's nothing else, I actually have a question for each of you. Um, so Laura, in uh, sheet mulching, how deep and how long do you recommend for killing a lawn? So it depends on what lawn you're killing. Um, I had a lawn in that house in, in uh, Wedgwood that had the, um, the sequo giant sequoia in the front that was really shady. There was a very old crab apple tree. Um, and I was able to keep the lawn going under it because I know how to grow lawn and I just keep putting fresh seed down for shade grass. and. You know, after a while, I was like, ah, why bother? I should just plant, you know, I could get all kinds of cool plants in here. So I sheet mulched it with um, layers of newspaper and about two inches of wood chips. Okay. And because it was a shady lawn, which was fairly sparse, that's all it took. That was it. Two if inches. In, if, yeah, so just a couple of inches. And it and actually just died. And then even in the next um, growing season, and I did that in the fall, in the next growing season, that soil was much looser, even a couple inches down from mm -hmm. what it had been. It was very right. clay, tough soil. If you're out in the sun in a big area where you have a thick sodded grass, you need to put about four to six inches of mulch on it. Um, you really need to smother the heck out of it. How how long do you think for, and I guess it depends on when, when in the year you're doing it, putting the, the yeah. mulch down, but what's sort um, of a rule of thumb there? It, you know, I think this is a great time of year because that rain helps to, um, helps to um, have all the, the material that you've sheet mulched it with start to break down, which helps to um, kill the grass too. So there's a lot of uh, activity in the soil that's happening. Um, and that seems to help speed up the decomposition of the grass underneath it. Plus it's not an active growing season for the grass once it gets right. too cold. So that combination of things is really, really helpful. Um, so if you're doing it in the winter, you know, you can get through, pro you know, if you do it in October, November, um, by February, it should be gone. Cool. If you're doing it during the middle of the growing season, it might take the whole summer into the fall for it to die back and it, you know it's going to be a case-by-case -case thing of how strong that grass is um, the weaker the grass is the quicker it's going to disappear um, but the grasses that have a thick um, duff layer so to speak will take longer to break down completely mm -hmm. they may not be alive anymore but you're going to have this sort of um, thatch layer underneath right. there that won't have decomposed cool thanks and then uh Christy, I'll just, I'll leave this question with this, but are sheet mulch, can you sheet mulch in the Soak It Up Rebate program? Oh, great question. Uh, you can sheet mulch in the Soak It Up program. So again, if you're sheet mulching for the native landscaping, um, we want to get that application first, um, but we totally encourage it. And I think there's a lot of benefit to the soil to sheet mulch as opposed to just rip it out. Um, so we absolutely encourage that. We just want to make sure that when that project gets started, that that uh, grass is completely gone. That's something when we come to do that post inspection, we'll be looking for. Um, you don't want to halfway sheet mulch and then like let it come back up because when you add that like oh. layer of compost and good soil, it is just going to thrive. Uh, so make sure you get it out completely. But sheet mulching is certainly um, it's a great strategy. Cool. Well, thank you both so much. And uh, thank you everybody for coming. I'm just gonna share my screen back really quick to show what we have up next in this series. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, Christy for filling in and Laura for the awesome presentation. Um, oops. after all those tricks. Okay, there we go. Um, so next up, we'll be doing this. We have three more sessions left um, on Wednesdays, 6.30, same time. Uh, there'll be a different link for each uh, episode. So be sure to go back to that shorelinewa.gov slash natural yard care.
page and click on the different sessions to register for them individually. Uh, but we're really excited. We'll have um, some Garden Hotline folks back next week to talk dirty. So we'll go really deep into the different kinds of compost and mulch and how to use them and, and really just diving into that soil because it is so key um, as we heard about tonight. Um, and then if you were interested in kind of needing some design help, um, thinking about how to actually lay out some of these beds in these projects, join us for the, the following week. So October 14th. Um, to talk about successful gardens for the North Pacific Northwest. And that's where we'll, we'll talk about some of those core design elements, go deeper and geek out on some of the different native plants and um, you know, strategies you can use to really uh, compose a nice landscape. And then the final one in our series will just be a uh, fall garden prep. So kind of all of these practices that you can do to sort of close out the growing season and really set up your garden for um, a good overwintering that will build up into a flush of life in the spring. So thank you all for sharing your evening with us. Um, like I mentioned, I'll be sending out a follow-up um, email tomorrow with a link to the recording and uh, the raffle prize winners and the list of resources that were mentioned. And I will copy um, Christy on that as well. So if you guys want to reach out about the Soak It Up program, uh, you can have her email from there. So thank you both and thank you everybody for coming.